Amen. Who's ready for the word? Who's ready for the word? Amen. One of the things that I'm so proud um, about our hub attendees are people and individuals. You know, I, I was saying a few weeks ago that it's so easy to rally around a church because of good music or because of an ability to get launched into ministry or do something. But the common theme that we hear is, what do you love about the hub? The word, the word. And that to me is a win. I don't care what y'all, a win is a win. And I honestly am so humble to God. You know, I, I was nervous about preaching the God of order because it was, uh, it was tough. Um, and on the way out, Apostle, great sermon. I was like, what? You guys still want to come back to church, even though I told you about your, how disorderly you were? And it really showed me that there is a remnant of people who are not interested in having their ears and their flesh tickled. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it shows. Week after week, I come, I scream, I spit. And you guys all just say, wow, what a great, ouch. But that was great. And I think that's the, the, the mindset of a champion. I think that's the mindset of a mature believer who's not wanting to be coddled, wanting to be drinking milk all the time, but wanting the hard food. And so tonight, our sermon topic, I'm going to share it in a bit, but we're going to pray as we customarily do. But tonight's sermon is, is going to be, I, I, we, you really have to pray for spiritual understanding tonight because it's, it's, it's very, uh, I want to use the word mysterious. Um, it's going to be almost ambiguous and almost very vague. So I know we always pray for spiritual understanding, but tonight I really need you to press in because we're going to be talking about spirituality and spiritual matters um, that may not be so easy to comprehend, if that makes sense. And as I teach, you'll understand why we made these disclaimers. So I'm going to have you rise as we customarily do. And we're going to make decrees. And we're going to pray um, that the Lord give us spiritual understanding spiritual understanding i think this is a very good practice that uh you should do every time you open the word every time you're about to hear a sermon to pray to god for spiritual understanding so nice and big repeat after me say father in the name of jesus i receive spiritual understanding to comprehend the word tonight spirit of the living god Open my understanding that I might know and that I might behold wondrous things from out of thy law. Speak to me tonight from the standpoint of scripture. Let my understanding give birth to fruit and application in the word of God. Father, help me see you differently after tonight's word i decree my life is changed by the power of the word i decree the eyes of my understanding are being enlightened in the knowledge and in the wisdom of the son of god i decree that i hear the word and i understand the word i buy the flesh and move into the spirit I unlock my spiritual ears I unlock my heart I unlock my spiritual eyes and after tonight I will come to know you the true living God change my life by the power of the word in Jesus name I pray amen and amen amen you may be seated in the presence of the lord do you believe what you just said amen all right tonight's sermon topic is called the invi the invisibility of god the invisibility of god throughout the month of january we have been diving through the various facets and the various components of who god is and the Lord highlighted to me this month not to speak on the more obvious attributes. God is love. God is faithful. These stuff we know. But we've been diving into the more softer and more uh, deeper attributes of his person. We opened up, I believe, with Jehovah the Jealous. 
After that, we had the God of order. Then we did God the covenant keeper. And now this week we are doing the invisibility of God. So I'm asking that as I preach and as I teach, as I teach, as I teach, you guys hold me accountable. Um, pray for me because when trying to describe God's invisible nature, he's very protective over the way that he's esteemed and over the way that we perceive him. So I need you to pray for me. Father, please help me tonight to accurately describe your person and your nature. Forgive me in advance if I misrepresent you in my discourse. In Jesus' name, amen. Tonight's sermon objectives are threefold. Number one, God is going to impart an awareness and a consciousness of his invisible being. God's going to impart an awareness and a consciousness of his invisible being. Secondly, God is going to allow us to explore the vastness of his glorious nature. And thirdly, we're going to learn how we should handle potential appearances of God if and when they occur. If and when they occur. So I'm going to start by giving some definitions. We're dealing with the invisibility of God. And so I thought it was fitting to teach and to just describe by definition what invisible means. Invisible means that which is hidden or concealed. That which is hidden or concealed. You're going to want to remember these definitions. In other words, in, to be invisible means to be not seen. Now, I did not say that to be invisible means to be not real. I said it means to be hidden or to be concealed. So in other words, it's things not seen. So if we're going to describe God's invisibility, God's in invisibility, can, uh, invisibility can be defined as man's inability to see God's entire being or essence except for the parts of himself that he chooses to reveal through visible created things. I'll say it one more time. God's invisibility can be described as man's, human's inability to see God's entire being or essence except for the parts of himself that he chooses to reveal through visible created things. Now, why is it important for us to understand God's invisible nature? It's important for us to understand God's invisible nature because this knowledge is necessary for our relationship with him. Amen? So let's look at Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. Here are the writings of who we believe to be Paul. And Paul says, And without faith, it is what? To please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is the rewarder of those who seek him. Please keep this verse projected. This passage is outlining that the doorway, the avenue, the way, the formula to God is faith. He says, without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is. Some translations say, must believe that God exists. Now, how can we love and serve a God whom we cannot see that's often one of the most asked questions but tonight the lord will answer it for us but before we go let's go to uh, hebrews 11 and let's, let's go to verse 1. i think it's important to talk about faith because faith is described it says now faith is the substance of things hoped for the evidence of things what what is the definition of invisible things that are not seen so he says this faith is the substance what is a substance it's 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 a material tangible thing of things hoped for when you have hope in something it's because you presently don't have it right so faith is that substance your it's that substance things hoped for but it's also the evidence or the the confidence someone would say how do you know that stefan will show up on time my evidence is my faith, a.k.a. my trust in him. I tangibly cannot make him be on time, but my trust and my faith in him is what makes my confidence. It's that substance of things that are not seen. This is why he said without faith, it's impossible to please God because faith is invisible. So in order to contact a visible God, it takes an invisible substance called faith in order for a relationship to be with him. Amen. Amen. So, 
what does God look like? You ever sit down and say, I wonder what God looked at. How many, how many people prayed the prayer, Lord, I, I, what is it? show me your glory. Show me your face. So who or what does God look like? Here's the answer. Nobody except Jesus knows. Why? Because he is invisible. He is invisible. Let's look at John chapter 5 and 37. I love what Jesus says. Jesus says, and the Father who sent me, he has testified of me. You have neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his form. Jesus is revealing something very particular about his heavenly father. He's saying that God is invisible. Nobody has heard his voice and nobody has seen his form, his shape. So you want to know what God looks like? Jesus says nobody have seen it. Nobody. Nobody. Moses was a man who prayed and says, God, I want to see your face. Show me your glory. And through, and God said something very unique to Moses. Let's look at it, Exodus 33 and 20. This is what God said to Moses upon his request. But he said, you cannot see my face for no man, listen, can see me and live. No man, no person, no human being. He didn't say no angel. He didn't say no created being, celestial. He said, no man can see me and live. But how does this make sense? Because in the opening scripture, we just read that Jacob wrestled with God and he called the place Pinel. He says, because I saw God face to face. Just give me a minute and I'll explain it. So how do we try to describe this invisible God. John would say, whom having not seen you love. You know, human beings are so, they have, we, 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 we can do such more than we give ourselves credit for. Everybody says, oh, I don't know how people do long distance relationships. Christians, we're doing that. We're doing it. We're doing it. We've never seen his face before. Yet we talk on the phone all the time, prayer. Yet we do all these things with God. And one day we're waiting to see the face of it. We can do long distance relationships. We, because we're doing it. So how do we describe a God that is so powerful yet not seen? Yet is invisible. Remember, invisible doesn't mean not real. I oftentimes like to talk about things when we're dealing with fear. Fear is something that is invisible until it comes into your mind. The possibilities of you drowning on a, on a boat are, are pretty slim. But if that comes into your heart, all of a sudden now you see all the dangers. You see all the things. Why? Because at one time it was invisible to you. Or in other words, you, we, we, when we're ignorant to certain things, they don't bother us. I oftentimes say that sickness, I think what kills people faster than cancer is fear. People can have it in their body and not know and be just fine. But the moment they hear that there's something wrong, your mind goes into overdrive. Why? Because it was invisible. It doesn't mean that it wasn't there. It was always there. It was just not seen. Oh, Lord, help me tonight. So how can we describe God? Through two ways. Number one, through scriptural descriptions and through his creation. Let's look at John chapter 4 and 24. Stephen, don't get excited. You're doing well. I want you to read up until the colon with me. Now sing loud. One, two, three, read. God is a spirit. One more time again. One, two, three, read. God is a spirit. You want to know how you can describe God? He's a spirit. He's a spirit. But that doesn't help us, apostle. Just wait. God is a spirit. And his nature can be observed by things that are seen within his creation so how does this make sense because I remember prophet Ezekiel having visions of God with the four face create the four creature um, creation that he created he described them as a man with having feet like calves and they had four heads one was an eagle one was a lion one was an ox and one had a, had a human face. And above them, he said he resembled something that saw a throne and the appearance of a man. And he began to describe, he said that his hair was like wool. Or if, if that's not him, that was Daniel's description because Daniel also saw God. 
and he saw the Son of Man. But how does that make sense when Isaiah can stand and say, the day, in the year that King Isaiah died, I saw the Lord. But then you say that no man can see you. How? What they were seeing is they were seeing a spirit body or a celestial body, which is a part that God chose to make himself visible to the eye. I'm going to teach. I'm going to teach. So Isaiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel, they all had unique visions of God. Lord, help. I hope I'm representing you well, please. So when man tried their best to describe who God is, we have to be careful because God put strict parameters around how we describe him. And God likes to use the art called mystery and the art, the art called wonder. Let's look at Exodus 20 verses 4 to 5. God's all knowing. He knew we would try to figure out and try to describe him. So he says, you shall not make for yourself an idol. A what? For or any likeness of what is in the, say it, heaven, heaven above or in the, earth. or in the water under the earth. Verse 5, you shall not worship them nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a what kind of God? Jealous. So he's saying, if you guys are going to try and figure me out, here's what's off limits. Don't you ever try to limit me to what you've seen in the heavens above, earth beneath, or under the water. And he explains why, because I'm jealous. So he's trying to protect our perception. Let's look at Romans chapter one and verse 23. I told you that we can observe and describe God through scripture and through creation. Here's creation. Paul was talking about people who did not like to retain God in their knowledge. And he says, and these rebellious people, they exchanged the glory or the beauty of the incorruptible God for an image. For a what? In the form of corruptible man. And of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. Let's go to Romans 1 and 20. Romans 1 and 20. We can understand God through creation. Paul says a few verses up. He says, for since the creation of the world his invisible attributes what kind of attributes invisible. are you seeing this God's teaching us through Paul for since the creation of the world his invisible attributes his eternal power and his divine nature have been clearly seen being understood through what has been made do you know what he's saying here if you want to know who I am observe the scriptures and observe creation not for a form or a shape but he says you can see my divine nature my invisible attributes through the things that you can clearly see on earth oh isaiah 6 and verse 3 i quoted it but i'll read it this is the seraphim in heaven above the throne he says, and one called out to one another saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. What is it full of his? Another, uh, a, a, the, the more better translation is the, the fullness of the whole earth is his glory. The fullness of the whole earth is his glory. So Isaiah, or rather the seraphims were, were showing us that the whole earth, everything we see, is the glory of God, is the beauty of God, are the attributes of God. So let's take a, a deeper look at how creation reveals God's invisible attributes. Let's look at created things. Let's look at, say, the earth. We know in Genesis 1, the Bible says, and God created the heavens and the earth. And earth can be also looked at or translated as soil, dirt, or dust as we would call it. And it's, I want you to think about the goodness of God. God created the soil and the earth. And then he also said that he, he spoke to the ground and commanded the ground to yield vegetation, herbs, produce. Now, there's a, there's a plethora of things that come out of the ground. Our food comes from the ground. This is the food he ordained. Not the plastic they're feeding us today. I, when, I, when I think of the goodness of God, I say, how can a watermelon that tastes this good come from the ground? 
So our organic produce and our reproduction of agriculture comes from the earth. So the earth represents in a type and a shadow fertility. Remember, we can observe God's invisible attributes by the things that are clearly seen. So here's the mystery of soil. The earth is a place of conversion or translation. Just follow me. The earth is a place of conversion or translation. When you put something in the soil, it goes in one way and it comes out another. When you plant a mango seed, the mango seed doesn't look like a mango when you plant it. It looks like a seed. But yet when it begins to, now we know it comes from a tree, but just bear with me. Once you pick it, the mango from off that tree, it, does, it doesn't look like this. It's not in the same form. Paul would describe this. I didn't give this to you, sir, but can you look up 1 Corinthians chapter 15, first, verse 40. I'm going to read to 44. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 40 to 44. Here's how it reads. This is, Paul's just going to explain it for us. Remember, we're talking about the mystery of the earth and we're describing how we can see God's invisible attributes. Paul would say, For there are also heavenly bodies and earthly bodies. But the glory or the beauty of the heavenly is one type and the glory of the earthly is another. Next verse. There is one glory of the sun, of the moon, and the stars, and they all defer. 42. This is where it gets good. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown. What is it done? So it's planted. The mystery of the soil. Our perishable, fleshly, natural body, just like a seed, just like a plant, is planted as a perishable body but it's raised up how an imperishable body verse 43 it's sown in dishonor but it's raised in glory it's sown in weakness but it's raised in power 44 it is sown a natural body but it is raised a spiritual body so in other words you have to understand this man human beings if you live and breathe have two feet have a soul a mind and a spirit you are a body okay we were born in creation we were formed where from the dust remember the mystery of the soil our food is not the only thing that comes from the soil we came from the earth we so when we die we return back but our natural body goes in as a seed and it's now raised up a spiritual body are you seeing that so when we come, when we talk about fertility, we talk about God. So what does this have to do with God's invisible attributes? This is what happens to us at salvation. Jesus, 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 Jesus. He's using the soil to show us that, guys, what Job says, when a man dies, will he live again? The answer is yes. The answer is yes. Or in other words, Paul would describe water baptism. We call it a liquid grave. Your representation is you go down, you die, and then you're raised up in the newness of life, Romans 6. But it's a liquid grave. The grave is what? The soil. The soil represents the earth. So salvation and transformation. Not only when we begin, when we get saved, we are we come to life. It says that we are given a quickening spirit. We come to life, but not only do we have a new life, we now transform. Remember I told you about the mango seed? The mango seed looks different from the mango. And this is what happens to the believer's transformation. You come to Christ, you get saved, you begin to grow and mature. And then you begin to day by day, you're conformed into the image. Let's look at animals. Animals reveal part of God's invisible attributes. I love lions. Anybody love lions? And I'm not talking about Moses' last name, but I mean like lions. The animal kingdom reveals an invisible attribute of God's internal power and also of his divine nature. When we look at the animal kingdom, the Bible also describes. So it's very important that you understand that we say that the lion is the king of the jungle. Every other animal is scared, is reverenced, or is, is, has honor towards a lion. Scripture would also use this type of language to describe Jesus. Let's look at it, Revelations 5 and 5. Revelation, one, it's not S, Revelation. Here's how it reads. And one of the elders said to me, don't cry. 
Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah. Why would Apostle John use a language from the animal kingdom to describe? He's showing you that the way that the animals will revere the, 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 the lion is the way that his creation shouldn't have to worry because the king, the, the, the lion of the tribe of Judah is here. Even in heaven, I described to you about Ezekiel's vision in Ezekiel chapter 1. We see that one of the heads was the face of a lion, which shows me that in heaven there are animals or there are, there, there are celestial beings that may resemble these kind of things. I, I did say we were going a little bit spooky tonight, okay? But we're talking about the invisibility of God. Let's move on. Let's look at angels. Even angels reveal part of God's invisible nature and his eternal power. You have to understand something about this. Angels are celestial. They're heavenly beings. So angels have a body. I just read it to you in 1 Corinthians 15. Human beings have a body. So you have to understand. The Bible says in Genesis 1 that in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. If you read, I think it's the verse, chapter, uh, Genesis 2 and 1. It says, and God created the heavens and the earth and all their host all their people, all their inhabitants. Angels are inhabitants of heavenly realms. So angels are created beings, meaning that there's something in the angels that we can observe about God's divine nature, his eternal power, and also uh, his, his, his invisible attributes. So let's look at Colossians 1 and 16. Paul is describing, for by him, and him is Jesus, all things were created, both in the heavens and on the earth, things that are visible and in you, you're seeing this Jesus is Paul is telling us that God created things heaven and earth things that are seen with the eye and things that are not seen whether thrones he's speaking of angelic ranks or dominions or rulers or authority all things have be have been created through him and for him we know that angels are ministering spirits to the heirs of salvation they, they, they are servants to us but they are deployed by God. So in other words, angels are, they offer divine invisible assistance to the elect. Oh, Jesus. So when you think that you're all alone, remember what happened with prophet Elisha when, when, when the king sent people to come and get him and his servants started fretting and he's like, don't worry, those those who we have around us are more than those who are against us. He said, what are you talking about? He prayed that his eyes would be open. And when he opened his eyes, the servant began to see the chariots of angelic fire forces. Angels. So this represents a part of God's divine nature. Let's look at human beings. I'm almost through. Humans reveal part of God's invisible attributes, divine nature and eternal power. Genesis 1 and 26. Mm, 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 mm. Okay, we're all, we all can read, right? Okay, we're going to look at some punctuation and grammar tonight. Then God said, let us, who's us? Father, son, he was, he was making them in the garden. God said, God is one person, but then he says, let us make man in our, plural, right there. Human beings are a semblance of the Trinity. Let us, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Spirit, Soul, body let us make man in our image according to our likeness you know what this means we were created in God's image God was not created in our image God is not a man oh Holy Spirit But for the sake of what Romans 1.20 says, let's look at how human beings can reflect and give us an idea of what God is like. Every human being has a mind. Every human being has a mind. So the human mind reveals a kind of nature that God the Father has. Here's the difference. Here's the difference. 
in mankind, we have a mind that functions. It's because of our brain that we can move and breathe and do all this, even though we know it's because of God and move and breathe, have our own being. But God created, if we were created in his image or his likeness, means we were created like him to some degree. So if God thought it fit to put a mind or a brain in human beings, guess what? He must have a kind of mind as well. I love how Paul would say, who can fathom the mind of God? Who can instruct him? How unsearchable are his ways? Oh, the depth of the wisdom. What is he speaking of? The mind of Christ. And P Paul also says, we have the mind of Christ. Meaning that Jesus has a mind. So this is the difference. In our understanding, man forgets. I have the worst memory. You tell me something, good luck. Especially if it's not important to me. But God is omniscient. He has a kind of mind that does not forget. He has a kind of mind that doesn't get overwhelmed. How is it that you oversee the earth and the billions of people you created and yet you're so invested in each person's life? I can't even keep up with my little three friends. Yet he knows what's going on at every point and every moment and he's at every beck and call, he's at every, how? So if, God, if humans have a mind, God has a mind. Let's look at humans' ability to eat. Did you know, oh, let me bless you. Did you know that God eats? Look, I know, just bear with me. God eats. Remember when the apostles were saying, Lord, who will be the greatest in the kingdom? And they were going back and forth. And Jesus said, whoever serves his neighbor. Jesus said something very interesting. Luke 22, please, verse 29. This is what Jesus says. And just as my father has granted me a kingdom, I grant you, verse 30, that you may eat and drink at my table in my... So you mean to tell me that there's going to be food in heaven? Yes. He just said, you read it, that you may eat and drink at my table. Can I bless you? The Lord's Supper was just a practice of what heaven will be like. This is why he wanted to break bread with his disciples. Why? Because he was showing them, guys, we're going to eat here now, but later there's a better feast. In my father's house, there are many mansions. If it were not so, would I not have told you? I go to the parables of the banquets. Come on. Can I go further? Genesis 18, read it on your own time. The angels of the Lord came to Abraham and when Abraham saw them, he went and met them and bowed. Number one, these were angels. However, it was God because when Abraham bowed, Stephen, you're getting excited. No, because we need to be out here on time. When the angels, when, when Abraham bowed to the angels or Abraham said, Lord, if the angels were not God or if that was not God they would have said no please stand <laughs> Jesus, 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 Jesus. and Abraham said Lord please permit that I kill a calf and that I make you some supper and God said go and do as you said and God waited it was God and two angels okay it was God and two he waited for Abraham and Sarah to make the meal and you know what the Bible says and they sat and they ate Abraham had a meal with God. Oh, Jesus. Anyways, all that to say is in heaven we're going to eat, huh? Yeah. Praise him. I can even go further. You remember the, 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 the vision uh, Peter had when the beasts were coming down that he called unclean? They were coming down from heaven. Down from heaven. Down from heaven because there's food up. All right. We're still looking at human beings. Paternal and maternal instincts reveal attributes of God the Father. If you have a if you have a child, naturally you're going to be protective. Is God not protective over you? So the way you feel about your child, your spouse, anything that belongs to you, it reveals God's protective, jealous nature over you. Even look at diversity. God didn't make just Jamaicans. He didn't just make Africans. He didn't just make, he made us all different. Why? Because in heaven, it, it, there represents a diversity. Which is why I say if you're the, if. Thank you. 
thank you Holy Ghost Revelation talks about the various tribes tongues and nations that will be represented in heaven so apostle are you saying that God is a man no numbers 23 and 19 God is not a man period this God though means God the Father you want to know who is a man Jesus God the Father is not a man but God the Son Jesus the Christ he's a man in other words we call him the God man why because Jesus he accurately reveals God's invisible attributes and his eternal power in morality in character and in his nature Jesus can boldly say if you've seen me you've seen the Father why Jesus is God God was a man excuse me God is a man because he's still alive let's affirm it first for uh, Colossians 1 and 15 uh, <laughs> he Jesus is the image of the the firstborn of all creation Hebrews 1 and 3 he, Jesus, is the radiance of God the Father's glory and he's the exact representation of his nature. God the Father is, is not a man. God the Son is a man. How do we know that God is a man? Because he was born of a woman. But can I bless you? What, this is what's unique about Jesus. Joseph! is not Jesus's father. How do I know? It took the persuasion of an angel in a dream to tell Joseph, look, I know this is super messy, but I just need to borrow your fiance's womb. I know you guys are about to get married, but please don't cancel the wedding. I truly impregnated her. The Bible says that the spirit of God came into Mary's womb. So, Jesus is a man because he was born of a woman. But here's what's different. His father is divine, but his mother is natural. So Jesus is a different kind of man. He's a hybrid, if you would. He's a mixed breed, if you would. I don't mean to, sorry, but that's just terms we can understand. Somebody say, Jesus is a man. Jesus is God. How do these two coexist? God is a man, but God is, Jesus is a man, but Jesus is also God. This is why Jesus was born perfect, sinless, and spotless because his paternal nature has no sin. So he, in other words, he defied the human order. The Bible says we're all born in sin and shaped in iniquity, not Jesus, because of who his father is. So, how do we know that Jesus was fully man? Number one, he was born of a woman. Number two, Jesus has a body. Do you know that he still has the body today that he had when he was here on earth? Remember, it's sown because Jesus is a man. Jesus died. This is not like a, he didn't fake his death. He died. Only human beings die. He was a man. So, I know that Jesus still has his body in heaven. Jesus has his physical body in heaven. It's just a different form called a resurrected body. Now, remember when Jesus died, did what he had to do, rose again, then he came back with his disciples in a room. They all, oh, Lord, what, what are you doing here? Is it really you? Thomas said, I don't believe. If it's you, let me stick my hand in your side. Why would he still have the scar if he really wasn't a man? Jesus still has the scar. He still has everything inside of him. He, he looks exactly today in heaven, seated at the right hand of the Father, as he did when he was on earth. And this is why we read in Colossians 1 and 15 that he's the firstborn of all creation because just as he has his new resurrected body, when we die, we're going to get ours. Romans 8 says that for a long time, creation's groaning, wanting to, you know, be clothed. Um, if, if not, that is 2 Corinthians 5. And, uh, 5. We're, we're groaning within ourselves, wanting to have a new tent, our new bodies. Why? Because we're tired of being subject to futility. 
Jesus is the pattern. He died and rose again to show us what will happen. Remember when he died? The Bible says the graves were open and people started to resurrect too. It's going to happen to us. Are you guys okay? Okay. I'm, we're talking about the invisible God. So, Jesus was a man. How do we know he was a man? He needed to sleep. Remember underneath the boat during the thing? He was sleeping. But the Bible says God neither slumbers nor sleeps. So this shows us that he was a man, but yet he was God. Philippians 2 will teach us that God, Jesus, he agreed to coming into the earth and he humbled himself and took on the form of a servant. What are you doing coming off your throne, sir? But he humbled himself and became a little lower than the angels. In other words, he put on flesh and he chose to do that willingly. When he left his throne, he didn't lose his heavenly divine attributes. He had all of them. Which, why do you think the miracles were so great? He had all of these things. So, as I wrap up, I want to teach just a little bit on what theologians would call theophanies. Somebody say theophanies. Theophanies. T-H-E-O-P-H-A-N-I-E-S. Theophanies. So, what about people who claim to have encounters and people who claim to see God and people who claim to see Jesus? Let's look at it. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 16. This is Paul talking about our king. He says, who alone possesses immortality and dwells in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see. So, Paul is saying that this God no man has seen him and no man can see him. Jesus would say in John 1 and 18, no man has seen God in any time. But through the language and through God and his graciousness, he has oftentimes allowed for humanity to see him in what we call theophanies. So I'm going to give you two definitions. Number one, God oftentimes uses anthropomorphic language. Anthropomorphic language. And anthropomorphic language means language that speaks of God in human or creation terminology. So that just means that God uses the things that we can see to describe himself. It's not him, but only because our understanding is limited, he has to speak in a way that we can relate to. This is what, a, this is what, a, this is what anthropomorphic language is. Now a theophany defined is an appearance of God in visible form. An appearance of God in visible form. Remember Moses, Lord, Show me your glory. I want to see your face. Moses, God said to Moses, I can't show you because if I do, I have to kill you. But I'm going to hide you in the cleft of a rock. And I'm going to let my glory pass over you. And he says what? And Moses saw his back part. Can I bless you? God has a back. Through a theophany, through an appearance of God in visible form, he allowed Moses to see his back. Can God appear to man? Yes. How? Through, theoph through theophanies. Now, it's very important to understand this because theophanies are written right through scripture. Remember in the burning bush? The Bible says the angel of the Lord came and then he spoke to God to the burning bush. God was not the fire and God was not the bush. But he knew that the bush would get his attention. So he spoke to God out of the midst of the fire. Do you remember the children of Israel? Pillar of fire by night, cloud by day. That says that God led them. God is not clouds. God is not pillars of fire. But however, he puts a visible form of himself so that we can understand it and be able to relate to it. Is it are you understanding? So when I talk about Jacob, oh, how he wrestled with God. He wrestled the angel of the Lord and the angel of the Lord is different from regular angels. The angel of the Lord is, is a being that God takes on to visit man. So when he wrestled the angel, he really wrestled God because God opened his eyes that he might be able to see that this is me. Although you're, you're wrestling and we're fighting and I'm going to you know, hit you in your thigh. He said, surely I've seen the Lord. Does he mean that he saw God in his real full glory? No, he saw a theophany. He saw a kind, he saw a visible form. So what does this mean for the believer? Number one, if God can appear to man, 
if you have visions, dreams, or encounters of you saying you saw the Lord and you see Jesus, I have some warnings and some cautions and some protocols. Number one, vet every encounter against scripture to find consistencies with his will, with his character, and with his ways. Because you know that angels of light deliver messages too? Do you know that false spirits understand that this is how God uses? So he will come to you in the form of a dead grandmother or he will come to you in the form of somebody that and then all these dreams and manipulation begin to cause things that be not as though they were. There's certain things that I know that only me and God knows. And when he's trying to speak to me, there's like certain code words. I know this can only be God. It's called a theophany. And I want to bless you with this. Do not take visible appearances literally. Only take the words literally. Because if Jacob had walked away, or if, let's use for example, if Moses had walked away, he would have said, guys, God is a burning bush. He's a burning bush. I saw him. He spoke to me. God, I know he's a burning bush. But Moses had an understanding that this is just a theophany. God is not the burning bush, but he's in the burning bush. Remember when Moses struck the rock? This rock is Jesus. The only one. Amen. Water came out of the rock. We sing Hosanna, blessed be the rock. Is God a rock? No. But he's giving a theophany. He's, he's using anthropomorphic language to define, I'm as strong as a rock. I'm not the rock. But I'm as strong as a rock. Stephen, you said you were going to teach. Stop screaming. So, why does God choose to remain invisible? This is the point of my whole message. Why does God choose to remain invisible? Are you ready? He chooses to remain invisible because he wants to maintain his mystery and wonder of his unveiling in heaven. He remains a mystery in this realm because he knows that we are earnestly waiting. Oh, I want to see him to look upon his face. Man. You guys know this one? I don't know it. That's why I stopped singing. <laughs> on the streets of glory, all, all the years have passed. All <laughs> ever to rejoice. But we're going to see him one day, amen? He remains anonymous to the human realm of our eyes because he wants to maintain the mystery and the wonder of his unveiling in heaven. Paul would say that one day we will see him face to face. When talking about the gifts of the Spirit, he says we look through a glass dimly. But one day we will see face to face. Apostle John would say, let's project 1 John 3 and 2. He says, Beloved, now we are the children of God, and it has not appeared as yet what we will be. But we know that when he appears, we will be like him. Why? Because we will see him just as he is. Do you remember? I believe it's in, oh, help me Jesus. Paul was talking about the veil that's over the eyes of the Jews concerning salvation. He's saying, right, anybody who comes to faith, the veil is lifted off. This is the, right now to a degree, at, in our limited space and time, God has a spiritual veil over our eyes. That at, the period, at the appearing of Christ, at the appearing of God, that veil will be removed and we will see him just as he is. Apostle John says clearly that we will see his face. Revelation 22, verse 3. And there shall be no more curse. He's talking about what's going to happen in heaven. But the throne of God and the Lamb. That's the God the Father and God the Son. Shall be in it. And his servants, that's us. If you're a servant of the Lord, say, I, I. shall serve him. Verse 4. And they shall see his face. Why does God want to remain invisible he's setting up he's building that suspense some sweet day i'm going away all right we're good 
I actually know the full words of this song, but it's just not a just not the place. So he's building up anticipation for that great day in heaven. And God understands one thing about human beings. Unfortunately, creation becomes familiar with what it frequently has access to. I'll say that again. Creation has a, has a tendency to become familiar with what it has frequent access to. Remember Jesus when he went back to his hometown to do miracles? They didn't see the Messiah that they heard about preaching from village to village. They said, is this not Mary's son? I swear I went to high school with him though. And they checked the yearbooks and saw that he was in their class. And they could not take him seriously. So they knew him as Jesus the carpenter, but not Jesus the Messiah. Why? Because they frequently saw him. So God wanted to hide himself. The Bible says in unapproachable light. Oh dear. For, go back to 1 Timothy 6, 16. I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. First Timothy 6, 16. Who alone possesses it? God who dwells in unapproachable light. You, light is an oxymoron. I'm getting excited, Stephen. You're doing good. Light is an oxymoron. Light, is, it's, light has the, capa the capacity to blind you, but also give you visibility. Oh, Jesus. Listen, 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 listen. Ah, I'm going to preach. Hold on, hold on. Moses, can I teach? <laughs> So God, John would call him, he said, God is light. Remember when God appeared to Paul? He said, a light from heaven flashed. And as a result of the light, the light blinded Paul for three days. How does the thing that's supposed to give you visibility blind you? How do we know God is like this? I know that God saw, that Paul saw Jesus because if you look at the sun for too long, anything you see, you can't see anything else around it. Remember, the sun is not God, S-U-N. But the sun, it's a representation of the brightness and the radiance of Christ. So God is light. When Paul saw Jesus, he was blinded. In so much that those who were with him, the Bible says they didn't hear the voice, but they even saw the light too. You want to know why God hides himself in unapproachable light? Because he doesn't want to kill us. Had Paul seen Jesus face to face, that would have been the end of him. Because no man shall see God and live. So he wraps himself in light and protect and light has a way to make you bow and reverence and honor it because I just can't because I can't contain I can't seem to it automatically brings you to your knees because the light is blinding theophanies theophanies is God a man is God the father a man no God the son is a man and God has a type of spirit body John says God is a spirit he's a spirit and through the teachings of Paul we understand that he has a spirit body that is more superior to the body of angels you have to understand God did not create human beings and angels and the heavens and the earth just like him remember we were made in his image and in his likeness we weren't made an exact carbon copy so this is why when Lucifer tried his best to exalt his throne, God said, you must not understand who, how this works here. And in his jealousy, he thrusted him out of heaven. God is invisible. Say God is invisible. And can I bless you with this? Seeing and understanding his invisibility is worth the wait. It's worth it. We don't have to see this man. To the, and can I bless you with this? God will not catfish you. When we get to heaven, we will not be let down. Because if he's this good, invisible, imagine when we see his face. Paul says, the human natural body has one glory, one beauty. You ever see some good looking people? My wife, huh? And your wife and your husband or your future? Imagine how beautiful they are. Paul would say that's one type of beauty. 
But when you receive your celestial resurrected body, there's going to be a new glory, a new reign. No wonder Paul says we move from strength to strength, faith to faith, glory to so we only get more beautiful why because in oh holy ghost i'm trying to stop and you're helping me this is what the holy ghost just said man was made from dust we return to dust and die and we resurrected to our resurrection bodies jesus does the opposite jesus was a celestial being first and then he put on flesh so it all it is it's a swapping. We were born man first, and then soon we'll be born a, a we'll be born a spiritual body. But Jesus always possessed one. But in order to affect this realm, he had to put on mortal flesh. Oh my days. God is invisible. And we don't have we don't even want to see you. We're content with just being able to observe your invisible attributes. I stopped praying that prayer a long time ago. I don't need to see you to love you because your love has struck my heart. Your love has changed me. It's transformed me. The invisible God. He is the God that dwelt in between the cherubims. Every other temple, they have their idol erected in their temple, but not Yeshua. Why? Because he wanted to make sure. Guys, you don't need an image. Make no idol. All you know is I dwell in between the cherubims upon the Ark of the Covenant. And then through his son Jesus, he says what? He now, oh, Holy Ghost, please, I need to wrap up. Listen, 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 listen. Religion tries to put a God into a temple made with hands but you know what the bible says that we have this treasure where in earth in this is an earthen vessel this is where god wants to live he doesn't want to live here he wants to live here so no wonder the, the songwriter says welcome into this place welcome into this broken vessel lord prepare me me to be a sanctuary why he is where this is where he wants to reside he dwells he's a god that dwells in temples not made with hands not by human hands but by his hands you know god has hands mighty are the works of his his hands may not have five fingers they may have 12 they may have two it doesn't matter but he has hands god has feet Remember when, when Adam and Eve were walking, when they were, they sinned and they hit, they said they heard the, they heard God walking. God walks. He may not walk, he may walk on his hands. We don't know. But just as human beings have the capability to move and function and do, do you know that God works? God works. That's why I rebuke people. What do you mean you're a man and you don't want to work? Jesus said, the Father works, so I work. And he says, even now, he's still working. When God created creation, he was working. That's why on the seventh day, he rested. Did you know that God rests? Oh, oh my God. God rests. God works. You see, when we think of kings and kingdoms, we think of a person who sits on the throne and gets fed grapes, not our king. He's working in the affairs of our lives at all times, coordinating people, crossing destinies, allowing things to work. He is working. God works. God rests. Scripture explains these things. This is the invisible God with an invisible angelic host of armies to fight on your behalf. So you think it's strange that when you're on the road and then a car automatically swerves in front of you and that should have been you, but it was the other car. You want to know what it was? The angels pulling that car back. You thought you slammed on the brakes? No. No. You have to understand the invisible realm. If God grants grace, I'll probably do a part two to this because I want to talk about the unseen realm. We have to break covenant with what we can see. If you live in the realm of what you can see, you'll be limited. If you could see the thousands of angels that are in this place right now, because I got enough of my own and all of you have angels assigned to you. But if you don't know them and you don't discern them and you can't see them, you're going to think you're unassisted. 
Do you remember when, I'm done, I'm done. Let me close this because if I don't. Do you remember when they were gonna seize Jesus? Peter asked the question, Lord, do you, do you want us to, why don't you want us to call down fire from heaven? Peter, a man, knew that fire could fall because he heard that Elijah did it. <laughs> you have to understand the unseen realm. Break covenant with what you can see. The God we serve is invisible. Say he's the invisible God. He's the invisible God. We serve a God who we do not see. We see him in the spirit. But with our natural eyes, we don't behold him. But when we get to heaven, the way that you're looking at me is the way you will look at him. And that glory, I don't even think we'll be able to have the words to describe the beauty and the splendor. Don't get hung up on the things you see in the natural. Moses should have said, God is a, God is a, he's a burning bush. I know it. I know it. Jacob could have said, God is a very violent man. He broke my hip and I'm stuck with this limp. But this also shows God's contending nature. Remember, the things that are clearly seen relate his, his visibility. So I, I empower you tonight with this knowledge. There are certain things that we have to know. And I believe this component, this side of God is one of the things we just have to know. Amen? Amen. I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. Let's stand.